All right, so uh, we're up and running. I want to say hello to everybody. For those of you who haven't uh, met me before, my name is Gary Wan. I'm the membership director for the Tsungshin Association of Hawaii. And I want to welcome you all to the second of a two-part webinar series of the 19th century Chinese who migrated from China to America. Last week, we looked at Hawaii, and this week, we're going to go ahead and focus in on California. OK, let's bring in our guest speaker now. In addition to almost 50 years in the archaeological and historical research, I, I found out last week that he got his PhD 42 years ago. He's also a member of the Tsungshin Association of Hawaii. And after the incredible job he did last week, Someone actually emailed me and suggested we get him to check with Ancestry.com to find out if he had any Chinese blood in him. <laughs> Maybe we can get, we can ask Brian if he knows how many Chinese migrated to Ireland. You know, his presentation last week on the Hawaiian Chinese experience was beautiful. Today's talk, I suspect, will be equally engaging and fascinating. So let me welcome Dr. Brian, Dylan. Brian, glad to see you again. Yes, thanks, Gary. Um, in, in, uh, I, I don't know that I actually have any Chinese in my ancestry, but uh, I've been married to a Chinese girl now for 46 years, so it's rubbed off quite a bit. Um, in, in terms of how many Chinese in Ireland, not many, but now you can eat the food in Ireland. It's no longer poisonous. And you know why, of course, because all, all the cooks are now Chinese in Ireland. It's safe to eat the food. Okay, anyway, um, I want to thank uh, Gary in Honolulu and Gail and Jeannie in the Bay Area for hosting me and then also the folks down in LA. So we have three different hosts. Thanks so much for having me back uh, the second time. Um, apologies for all the confusion last week. Uh, it was not the fault of any of the hosts. It was the fault of the 11 year old kid they had running Zoom last week. He was playing video games or something. Anyway, today we're going to uh, shift focus last week we, we said an awful lot about the Hakka, and we also were mainly concentrating on Hawaii. This week, we're moving to California, and most of the focus this week is on the Cantonese. So um, there's 55 slides in the program, and I've timed it at just about exactly 45 minutes. If I rush through it, it may go a little uh, faster. If I dawdle, it may, it may go a few Maybe. minutes longer. Okay, so um, I won't repeat any of the introductory comments from last week's lecture. If you missed the first one, uh, please know that we're recording both, okay? Uh, for starters, a little bit about the present day Chinese American population. There's just under 20 million Chinese that live in the U.S., and it's roughly about one and a half percent of the total population. California, of course, has the largest Asian population in the U.S. It's about 15 percent of the total state, but of this total, only about three and a half percent are Chinese. Hawaii has about one-sixth as many Chinese people as California does, uh, but the census counts part Chinese as well, and most of those folks that are part Chinese also are listed as Hawaiian. So if you really want to look at the pure Chinese population in Hawaii, it's only about half of 1% nowadays. And of course, everybody knows that the U.S. Census Bureau does not distinguish between different Chinese ethnic groups. So we really have no clue from the U.S. government as to what percentage of the Chinese population in America is Hakka as opposed to Cantonese as opposed to North Chinese Mandarin speaker, excuse me, Mandarin speaking people. Everybody knows, however, that Hawaii has the most Hakka, California, the most Punti or Cantonese, and New York has the most North Chinese. Okay, um, 
I've been involved in, in California history all my life. My dad was a very famous California historian. And I just got to say that for many, many years, the Chinese were completely omitted from California history before, because so many white historians either ignored or excluded the Chinese until very recently, they were more or less the invisible men of California history. And unfortunately, when they were mentioned, and only occasionally, comments about them were almost invariably wrong. So consequently, much of what I've written about the California Chinese and also what I've taught in the university uh, is myth busting. It's correcting errors that have been embedded in the literature, in some cases for 170 years. So let's look at some of these very common myths about the California Chinese. The first one is that the earliest Chinese came to California directly from China in 1849 to mine gold. This is completely wrong. Uh, the first uh, gold miners coming to California came from Hawaii, and they came in 1848, a whole year before the 49ers came. And they weren't the first. The very first Chinese in California were sailors on Spanish vessels coming up from Acapulco, and they came as early as 100 years before the gold rush. Okay, myth number two, after the initial rush, very few Chinese in California continued to mine gold. This is completely wrong. The Chinese kept on working in the mines and placer mining and open pit mining and hydraulic mining, every possible kind of gold mining there was for the next 40 or 50 years. Okay, myth number three, after completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, very few Chinese continued to do railroad work. Once again, this is dead wrong. Virtually every railroad in California was built by the Chinese. Everyone inside the state, everyone leading out of the state, and Chinese railroad crews kept on working long after the Golden Spike was driven. They kept on working for the next 30 years doing railroad work. Myth number four, all the Chinese that died in California had their bones shipped back to China for reburial. Again, this is wrong. Most of them did, but many did not. And there are lots and lots of forgotten Chinese graves throughout the length and breadth of California. And I'm an archeologist, I run into them all the time. Okay, myth number five, and here's, here's a big one. All Chinese on Chinese fighting in California were actually battles between rival tongs or criminal gangs. That is 100% wrong. The biggest battles ever fought in California between different Chinese groups were ethnic fighting. These were Punti versus Hakka battles. And at least two of them were record, well recorded in California history. They've been misinterpreted for 170 years. This is the same as the Punti Hakka fighting that's going on back home in China and overseas in Malaysia and other places. It was exported to Northern California too. And finally, myth number six, most late 19th and early 20th century uh, California Chinese history took place in San Francisco. Well, if you read the very few textbooks that mention the Chinese, that would be the impression you'd get, but it's absolutely wrong. The Chinese were in every one of the 58 counties presently making up California. They were in every part of the state doing all kinds of different things. And yes, at the very end, they became an urban population herded into a couple of very small ghettos, but that's at the very end of the story. I'm much more interested in the beginning of the story. Okay, so California Chinese history is everywhere. And uh, for so many years, if anybody even wrote about them, uh, basically it was limited to a single sentence in the textbooks. They built the railroads and then they all moved to San Francisco Chinatown. Well, California Chinese history is much, much more than that. They lived in every part of the state, sometimes in very great numbers. And their exclusion from California history books for many years was, in my opinion at least, part 
of a guilty conscience on the part of white historians. Now, California Chinese history is disturbing, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. In fact, my wife urged me to say this, and I will, parts of today's lecture, in fact, are rated PG-13 for historical violence. Anyway, about seven years ago, I published an article uh, presenting about 31 different Chinese historical locations in California, and uh, that's the map over there on the left. Each one, of course, has its own completely unique history and cast of characters. In today's lecture, we're only going to visit 22 locations in 22 different uh, California counties. Uh, it's all we have time for within the short time allotted. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if you look for Chinese history anywhere in California, the odds are very good that you're going to find it. Okay, the Chinese have absolutely positively been edited out of the picture. And here is the famous golden spike photo of 1869. And right before the cameraman tripped the shutter, they moved the hundreds of Chinese that were present out of the frame. They didn't want a single Chinese person to show up in this photograph. So you had hundreds of Chinese railroad workers just a few hundred yards to left and right, and they didn't let a single one in the picture. Uh, later, Governor Leland Stanford, uh, I guess pangs of guilt or something, when he had a, a painting made from this photograph, he had the artist add in two Chinese people. Okay, and this was not solely a function of the 19th century. Excluding the Chinese was de rigueur, that's French for commonplace. Uh, in 1949, Joseph Henry Jackson, who was a very re well-respected California historian, and he was the top guy at the San Francisco Chronicle, he published a beautifully illustrated book on the California gold rush, just in time for the 100th anniversary of the 49ers. And in this book, he doesn't write a single word about the Chinese. Well, one year after the publication of this book, my dad began working for Jackson, the same guy, as a book reviewer for the San Francisco Chronicle. And then a dozen years later, in 1962, my own father published the very first full-length book on the San Francisco Chinese, and it became a national bestseller. Okay, so the Chinese have been edited out of California history, but the overseas Chinese at the same time have been edited out, edited out of Maoist uh, Chinese history. A uh, shot of two uh, grinning chimps just escaped from the zoo over there on the left. Uh, that's a good friend of mine, Dr. Enzang Tong, a fellow archaeologist. Uh, he was educated in communist universities. Uh, he came as a visiting scholar to UCLA around 40 years ago, and I showed him California, and we did archaeology together. We had lots and lots of conversations, and he was flabbergasted to find that there were all kinds of overseas Chinese that were totally different from the Maoist modern-day post-1949 Chinese that he thought were the dominant species on the planet. Uh, anyway, uh, he was a pretty interesting guy. Uh, he was declared an enemy of the people by the Red Guards in 1967 for teaching what they called counter-revolutionary archaeology. Boy, that was my subject at Berkeley, too. But they sent Tong off to five years in a prison camp. Anyway, make a very long story short, uh, I opened his eyes about the overseas Chinese, and he went back to China and taught all kinds of classes now about the overseas Chinese for the first time. Okay, uh, there's a lot of basic sources on California Chinese history. Uh, the old intentional exclusion of the Chinese is over. It's a thing of the past, and there's a whole lot of books that have been published in recent years about the California Chinese. Uh, there's my dad's uh, bestseller over on the left, uh, came out almost exactly 60 years ago today. Unfortunately, most of these studies focus only on a single city, and that's San Francisco, and most of them are very recent. So 
everybody should consider these books just a point of departure, not the final word on the subject of California Chinese history. Anyway, uh, as an archeologist, I'm just as interested in the physical evidence for the Chinese in California, as much as the documents. Physical evidence is what archeologists always look for. Anyway, it's overlooked or ignored by most historians who seldom, if ever, leave the library. And once again, I have nothing at all against librarians. Both my parents were librarians and I'm married to a library. Okay. So I'm fond of saying California Chinese history is not just Angel Island. Uh, I've got nothing against Angel Island. There I am over on the right. That's me at age one looking at Angel Island. I grew up next to the place. But the whole point is the whole Angel Island story is very late. I'm much more interested in the early stuff. Okay. And Angel Island is the focus of urban Chinese history in California. I'm much more interested in rural California Chinese history. Okay, so the very first great Chinese overseas migration was to the Philippines, and it took place about a thousand years ago. Some people estimate that at least 25% of all Filipinos have some Chinese ancestry. And of course, uh, 500 years ago, the Spanish get into the picture and by the late 1500s, Spanish merchants were running treasure ships from China via Manila to Mexico. And of course, these were full of Chinese silks and porcelains, then the crews were basically all Chinese. So the very first Chinese to come to the New World came via the Philippines, courtesy of the Spaniards, and they came to stay in Mexico. Now, these were the Naus de China. That's the Spanish word. They, that means the China ships. For some reason, English speakers call them Manila galleons. So well, that's not correct. But anyway, for almost 300 years before the California gold rush, Chinese sailors jumped ship in Mexico and an overseas Chinese colony of thousands of people developed in West Mexico. So now let's move on to the gold rush in California. So here, one of the most famous photographs from the gold rush, there's four Cantonese uh, gold miners uh, to the right and three white miners to the left. This is in Placer County, uh, 1852. This is not uh, evidence of democratic interracial gold mining. The Punti have been hired by the white miners to do the real heavy lifting. They're humping the big baskets full of of gold bearing dirt up the hill so that the whites can wash it in the long tom over on the left. Now, the Chinese were not being paid in Yankee dollars, they were paid in gold dust, of course. By 1854, every fifth miner in California was Chinese. They were everywhere. Here's a wonderful uh, color image by Frank Marriott, who was an Englishman. And here we see two Cantonese guys uh, maybe going to put bids down at the horse auction in Sonora in Tuolumne County. By 1855, Chinese miners had spread throughout the length and breadth of Gold Rush, California, and they made up to 30% of the population of some counties. Now, the Chinese were the most efficient miners in California. They routinely got gold out of claims that had been previously abandoned by white miners. And they even reworked the tail heaps generated by earlier white miners recovering gold from the reject piles left by people less patient and less hardworking. And a lot of times you have to remind even, even uh, long time Californians that there wasn't just one gold rush. There were many different rushes at different times in different parts of California. And over on the left is my map showing a bunch of these different rushes in succession and the years that they, they came and went. The Chinese were involved in every last one of these different gold rushes. Now, one of the best short guides to the mother load, the biggest area, again, is by my dad. You can't go anywhere in California without following in my father's footsteps. Okay, so let's get away from documents. Let's look at physical evidence in the field. 
characters, mule paths. Well, the Chinese lived in every one of the 58 counties, as I said, and they left their marks everywhere. You just have to know what to look for. At left is a Chinese hand-built mule trail in the southern Sierra Nevada of Kern County, and this was made during the Kern River Rush of 1854. Here's a wagon road, an overgrown wagon road hand dug by Chinese labor crews 170 years ago. It leads to a long abandoned Chinese mining camp, once again in the southern Sierra Nevada, but this time we're in Tulare County. And then there's mining ditches and flumes all throughout California, the gold country, there's hundreds of miles of mining ditches and mining flumes, and they crisscross the landscape almost everywhere. They brought water to the gold workings, they powered the stamp mills, and they later powered the sawmills that sprang up everywhere once lumbering replaced gold panning. Virtually all of the California mining ditches were dug by the Chinese, and many of the flumes were built by them too. And the example on the left is from El Dorado County where a brand new fire just got going. Ah, terrible. And the one on the right is in Calaveras County. And I've worked in both counties for many, many years. Okay, and we're not just limited to California. The Chinese were doing gold mining all over the West. We just jumped the line north into Oregon. Here we are in Malheur National Forest. And what we see is remnant uh, ditches dug by Chinese miners, and this is actually on a mining claim that was filed and registered by a Chinese miner, and it's still on the books. Okay, long after the placer deposits were worked out, Chinese miners continued to work in California and in all the other western states and territories. Mining now shifted to hard rock tunneling below ground and to hydraulic mining above ground and the Chinese were hired to do the dirty work even into the 1890s, at least wherever local whites didn't run them out of town. Now, here we are in Humboldt County. As you can tell, I'm jumping all over the state here. Okay, wonderful shot from 1891, 43 years after the very first Chinese miners came from Hawaii to California in 1848 to get rich quick. Here we are in Butte County, and it's a giant open pit mine. You see the Chinese miners down at lower left. Okay, um, the Weaverville Chinese War took place in 1854. This was up in Trinity County. Now this was a Northern California extension of the Punti Hakka Wars being fought back home and in China at exactly the same time. About 400 Cantonese miners fought against only 150 Hakka, and as my Hakka family members are proud to remind me, the Hakka won. <laughs> anyway, two years later, another pitched battle, uh, even larger, took place near Chinese camp, uh, quite a bit to the south in Tuolumne County. This time, 1,200 Hakka miners fought only 900 Punti, and again, the Hakka won. Now, the motivations for this con these two conflicts were not understood in the 1850s by white Californians any more than they are today. They still continue to be mislabeled Tong Wars, as if they were fighting between rival criminal gangs. Not, not a bit of it. It's as if the French are fighting the Germans or the Irish are fighting the English or something like that. It's a matter of ethnic battles. Okay, uh, we're still in uh, Trinity County. The Weaverville Joss House is a wonderful uh, example of 1850s uh, Chinese construction from Northern California. It's one of the very few state parks with a Chinese theme. For many years, Trinity County was the most Chinese of all the California counties, and up to 30% of its population was mostly Punti, very few Hakka. But as the Placer Gold played out, the Chinese population dwindled down to only about 2,000 by 1870, then only 500 by 1885, and then only 20 people by 1920. Weaverville, the Trinity County seat, 
eventually was reduced to a single family Chinatown. And that one family maintained this wonderful Joss house until it was taken over by the state of California. Okay, building the railroads. This is one of the best photographs ever taken in, in California. Carlton Watkins, wonderful photographer. This is of the secret town trestle near Gold Run in Placer County, whole new county for you, done during the summer of 1867. And of course, the Chinese specialized in tunneling and blasting. After all, hey, they invented gunpowder, right? So anyway, on the left is a great shot also from 1867 from near Donner Pass, another new county, Nevada County, uh, same year, 1867. And he, this guy is bringing the midday meal to the tunnelers in the tunnel in the background. Um, they became very skilled both in California and Hawaii with blasting powder and then much later after its invention, dynamite. And you remember from last week, my uh, Hakka Chinese grandfather-in-law blew his hand off in Hawaii dynamite fishing in 1910. I uh, guess he cut the fuse a little too short. Anyway, but because the railroad workers drank tea made with boiled water instead of just drinking from polluted streams like most of the white guys did, Chinese railroad workers had many fewer sick days on the job than did white railroad workers. Okay, more physical evidence. Great Walls of China. You find these all through the Sierra Nevada along the old railroad alignments. This one is again near Donner Pass. It's up uh, in Nevada County. There's dozens and dozens of examples of these but only a few have been commemorated by markers like this one. Okay, uh, the Chinese continued laying track throughout north, south, east, west, every part of California, the mountains, the deserts, the coast uh, for many, many years, long after the golden spike was driven. Uh, here's a great shot from 1875 of a Chinese labor crew in the Mojave Desert. And I can tell you, I've worked out there doing archaeology. The temperature sometimes gets around 125 degrees in the middle of the summer. This is Kern County. Okay, not one resident of Los Angeles, California in a thousand is aware of how much they owe the Chinese for the creation of their city. Hundreds of Chinese dug the 90 foot deep Beals Cut, that's it at left, between 1861 and 63, and this opened up the wagon road between Los Angeles and Northern California. And then over on the right, between 1,000 and 1,500 Chinese dug and blasted San Fernando Tunnel, and they worked for an entire year in three ships around the clock, 24 hours a day, and they were paid exactly one buck a day. Nobody knows how many Chinese were killed in order to punch this tunnel through the mountains. A conservative estimate is at least 200. And for a while, this was the longest railroad tunnel in the world. Okay, moving on into uncharted territory. I've spent a lot of years working in the woods, doing archaeology off of the great woods of Northern California. And yes, uh, most of the loggers were all white. Okay, there were very few tree fellers that were Chinese, but the Chinese specialized in an aspect of forestry that is almost forgotten. It was firewood cutting. Uh, after the donkey engines came into the woods in the early 1880s, it was essentially Chinese crews that kept cutting the firewood to keep the donkey engines going. And the other element, Chinese element in the forestry picture is that they were the cooks. Uh, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of woods camps, little sawmills, 60, 100 people at each one. Uh, here's a typical backwoods camp on the right. That's in Siskiyou County. Uh, it was one of the temporary camps of the McLeod River Lumber Company. My uncle worked for that company 90 years ago in Siskiyou County. And you weren't any kind of outfit if you didn't have a Chinese cook. And in fact, a lot of white loggers refused to work for companies that didn't have white cook. I'm sorry, that didn't have Chinese cooks. The white guy said, hey, this, the, the food won't be any good if it's, unless it's, it's got a Chinese cook making it. 
Okay, uh, more on firewood cutters. Um, here is a wonderful example of uh, two, just two Chinese firewood cutters bringing tons and tons of firewood into Bodie, California in Mono County, uh, shots from about 1908. And they've got more than two dozen burrows and just tons and tons of firewood. So this was a real Chinese specialty for at least about 60, 70 years. Okay. Agriculture and agribusiness. Lake Tulare over on the left at the time of the California gold rush was the largest freshwater lake west of the Mississippi. And beginning in the 1860s, Chinese labor gangs began digging a 60 mile long canal to drain the lake. And they dug it across three different California counties, Tulare, Kings and Fresno counties. So they started draining the lake, and by the 1870s, much of the old lake bed had been turned into some of the world's richest farmland. Another 10 years later, agribusiness gets invented down here in the southern San Joaquin Valley, and it's the first place in the world where mechanical steam traction engines are pulling plows, and they're pulling plows that are plowing furrows miles in length. All of this would have been impossible without the Chinese. Water tunnels and irrigation, much closer to home where I am here in Southern California, the Southern California citrus boom of the 1870s and 1880s was once again made possible by Chinese water tunnelers in the San Gabriel and the San Bernardino mountains. Long before 20th century motorized pumps could bring water up from the subsurface water table, horizontal water tunnels were dug high in the mountains. And these tapped into sources of snowmelt water that then flowed by gravity, sometimes 10, 20, or 30 miles down through Chinese dug canals. And they ended up down at the orange groves, thousands of feet lower in elevation. Again, not one modern resident of Southern California in a thousand even knows this story. And it's never made it into the history books and seldom ever been mentioned in the classroom. And over on the left, these are not citrus guys. These are folks much further north up in Stanislaus County in the San Joaquin Valley. These are guys working with tree crops up there. Okay, physical evidence. Everywhere you go in backwoods California, you find traces of the Chinese. Uh, in many California counties, there are hundreds of miles of dry laid stone walls that were all built by the Chinese. Chinese workmen cleared fields for farming and ranching. They moved millions of rocks to the property lines of their white employers in all of these pre-barbed wire days. This is a great example that just goes from mile after mile in Tehama County. Uh, and uh, again, this is another place where there's a major fire burning right now. Okay, let's, uh, let's go aquatic. Chinese fishermen, shrimpers, and shellfish collectors. From as early as the 1850s, Chinese fishermen worked the inland waters of San Francisco Bay and more than 600 miles of the California coast, from Humboldt Bay all the way down to San Diego. They also specialized in things that we now take for granted, like abalone harvesting. Uh, this is a shot of Chinese junks at anchor in San Diego Bay, right at the turn of the century. And here's my favorite Chinese fishing camp. This is China Camp State Park, and this is only a few miles from where I grew up in Marin County. Um, this was one of the dozens of small Chinese fishing villages around the shores of San Francisco Bay. And they operated from the 1850s through the 1920s. And many dozens more of very similar nature were scattered up and down the California coast. Okay, here's Chinese fishermen in Sausalito, California, where my family's from. And they're selling their catch on Bridgeway Avenue, which would later be renamed, I'm sorry, it's Water Street, later renamed Bridgeway only after the Golden Gate Bridge was built. Shot takes place in 1888. Two years earlier, the Anti-Chinese League of Marin County urged that all white people boycott other white businesses buying seafood from the Chinese. But my, my grandmother who grew up in Sausalito bought fish from these guys anyway. 
Um, so Chinese fishermen and junks under sail were a very common sight from Sausalito. Okay, now we're gonna get into some of the darker uh, areas of Chinese history in California. Um, California led the way always with anti-Chinese racism. White supremacists were afraid that the Chinese would somehow outnumber whites in California. So their strategy was trying to make life so unpleasant for them that they would all just go back to China. At exactly the same time, intolerant wasps on the East Coast were just as paranoid about the thousands of poor Catholic Irish, my people, uh, potato famine refugees streaming into the country from the opposite direction. So here's a pretty nasty uh, political cartoon from 1860 showing the Chinese and the Irish gobbling up Uncle Sam um, from opposite directions of the country. At this point, I got a note that while my family is both Irish and Chinese, none of us have ever eaten a Yankee. Uh, they, they're just too bitter in taste. Okay, uh, Dennis Carney was California's worst racist. He was the most vocal and relentless anti-Chinese demagogue in California. And he was a failure at everything but rabble rousing. He was the leader of the so-called Working Man's Party he never won an election, but he fanned the flames of racial hatred every chance he got, and he injected racism into every aspect of public life in California year after year. Uh, Carney called on white Californians to make the streets of San Francisco run red with Chinese blood. That's a direct quote, but no massacre of Chinese ever occurred in the Bay Area. Unfortunately, Los Angeles was listening. Carney was indirectly responsible for a long string of occasional murders of individual Chinese, but he was never held accountable. And it wasn't just rabble rousers, it was the intelligentsia too. Here's Bret Hart, one of the most popular writers in old California, and his most famous work was the heathen Chinese, blatant racism. Uh, Mark Twain had previously been an admirer of Bret Hart, but he then called him heartless after he published The Heathen Chinese. Okay, so anti-Chinese racism now moves from California to Washington, D.C. Not one Californian in a thousand knows that virtually all of the county sheriff's departments in the state were formed exclusively to collect the racist foreign miners tax just from the Chinese. This was a tax that was never applied to white foreigners nor to Latinos. And those same tax collecting sheriffs never protected Chinese miners from white claim jumpers, robbers, or murderers. Anti-Chinese legislation began first as city ordinances in San Francisco in the 1850s, and then they went statewide during the following decades. 20 years later in 1882, California politicians pushed through anti-Chinese laws on the national level, all of them modeled on earlier California examples. And these laws were interpreted as giving the Chinese no rights of any kind and no protection under federal, state, or local law. Okay, another anti-Chinese California writer, Jack London, one of the most popular writers at the turn of the century, and he wrote romantic fiction about his early life as a swashbuckling oyster pirate on San Francisco Bay. Who did he steal from? He and other thugs stole exclusively from Chinese fishermen. They waited for them to do all the work, and then they boarded their boats and stole their catch, knowing full well that the Chinese were prohibited by California law from testifying in court against any white man. So in my family, we refer to Jack London as Jerk London. Okay, throughout the length and breadth of California, innocent Chinese were robbed, beaten, driven from their homes, and murdered by racist whites with complete impunity. One of the most horrible cases took place in the Hornitos Mariposa County Jail, that's it over on the right, where a Chinese man who was locked up inside for his own protection from a white lynch mob 
was somehow lured to the window, lassoed, and then beaten to death against the bars of his own jail cell. But not all Californians were anti-Chinese. Mark Twain, my hero, uh, was a popular newspaper writer, and he defended the California Chinese, and he really uh, took the nasty people to task. Uh, and he, he complained bitterly about how the Chinese were victimized by all kinds of Californians that were getting away with murder. Okay, and now on that happy note, Chinese mass murder, chapter one. For many years, a deadly bait and switch operation took place in Hong Kong. Chinese men who signed up to go to California were instead sent to the Guano Islands off the coast of Peru, where they were worked to death under horrific conditions. Being sent to the Peruvian Guano Islands under false pretenses was a one-way ticket to hell. It was a death sentence, and thousands of Chinese died there and never made it to California. Chinese mass murder, chapter two. Here we are in LA. The Chinatown massacre of 1871 in Los Angeles was the worst mass lynching of California history. Between 18 and 22, Chinese were lynched by an Anglo and Latino mob that was led by all the local law enforcement officers. And then every Chinese residence and business in town was looted. Nine men were eventually convicted of manslaughter for this horrible crime, but all nine were exonerated by the California Supreme Court. So the message was clear. If your victim was Chinese, you could get away with murder in California. And the last recorded Chinese lynching in California took place in 1901 in Kern County. It was a logging camp where all the loggers got together and lynched the camp cook. Okay, not simply restricted to California. Even worse massacres of Chinese than the, than the LA one took place outside of the state. In 1885 at Rock Springs, Wyoming, 28 Chinese were murdered, and then two years later, in 1887, just over the Oregon state line in southwestern Idaho, as many, 30, as many as 34 innocent Chinese gold miners were lynched. So, didn't stop just in the 19th century. Chinese mass murder continued into the 20th century. Now, many Chinese immigrants contracted with American sailors to smuggle them into L.A. County from coastal Baja, California, by boat. On the night of February 17, 1911, a U.S. revenue cutter gave chase to a smuggler's vessel in San Pedro Bay. There it is, number two on the map. The panicked smugglers eliminated the evidence of their wrongdoing by dumping at least a half dozen Chinese passengers over the side to drown. And then history repeated itself uh, about a week, two weeks later, uh, when the very same U.S. revenue cutter chased the very same group of smugglers in the very same boat. And this time they had an even larger group of Chinese immigrants from Baja California. And once again, the homicidal sailors threw all the Chinese overboard to drown. As always, the murderers were never prosecuted. And doesn't just happen on this side of the line. In August of 1902, 42 Chinese immigrants landed at San Felipe, Baja California. There it is, number one on the map over there. And they met a guide who promised to lead them across 120 miles of desert and over the border into California, USA. There's the border, number two up there. But the guide got lost and he abandoned his Chinese charges not even one third of the way to their destination. 35 of them died of thirst in the desert and 21 of them still remain unburied. So was this intentional mass murder? No, but was it negligent mass homicide? You betcha. And ever since this bone dry region has been called El Desierto de los Chinos, but it wasn't all bad. I got to you know, say something uplifting now after all of that terrible stuff. Not every California town or city was full of anti-Chinese racists. So, uh, case in point, 
tiny little West Point, which was an island of tolerance in the gold country. The white miners and the California Indians of West Point and Calaveras County, for example, welcomed the Chinese and they loved the annual Chinese New Year's parade. Somehow all the residents of this tiny town got along with each other and a dwindling number of increasingly elderly Chinese bachelors stayed on until the very last one died about a hundred years ago. But <laughs> turn the page, pretty neat. Uh, a brand new grocery store opened up on Main Street. That's Main Street there below at rush hour. And uh, it opened up about 25 years ago and was operated by, yep, you guessed it, an immigrant Chinese family. Hallelujah. Okay. So the pattern in rural California becomes at towards the end of the 19th century, you have all these one man California Chinatowns. Um, a few of the men married local California Indian or Mexican girls. And so once the uh, nasty whites found out about this, they rushed through anti miscegnation laws to prevent such Chinese mixed marriages. And these incredibly nasty laws stayed on the books until 1948. But anyway, as the years passed, the little all male Chinatown scattered throughout the California gold country grew smaller and smaller and smaller until by about 1900, there were no Chinese left in many of the California counties or you had these one man Chinatowns. For example, in Calaveras County in 1860, 22% of the population was Chinese. By 1900, only 23 Chinese men remained. By 1910, there were only 10. And by 1920, there were none. On the left is an example of this. This is Ah Lim. He's probably in his late 90s. Um, and he was the very last Chinese resident of a tiny mining town of Jenny Lind in Calaveras County. OK. So off to the ghetto, as the Chinese rural population disappears, the Chinese population in California tends to become urban. And this is the last chapter of the story. On the left, San Francisco, on the right, Los Angeles. And again, uh, these are obviously Kun Ti fellows. Uh, the long queues disappeared after 1911 when the 250 year old imperial law requiring them as a mark of loyalty to the Manchu emperor disappeared. Okay, California Chinese dead. Um, contract laborers after 1865 often had their return passage to China in case of their death in California transferred to the costs of exhuming their skeletons and shipping them back to their home villages for reburial. This is a wonderful shot from 1915. And here, two old men are dictating biographical information to a much younger calligrapher. And he's touching up the temporary wooden uh, headboards on Chinese graves. This is in San Mateo County, south of San Francisco. Unfortunately, portions of the cemetery were obliterated when the Interstate 280 freeway was routed right through it in 1955. And not everybody made it back to China. There are thousands of lost Chinese burials still in California. Uh, 28 years ago, I discovered unmarked Chinese graves on the isolated and beautiful lost coast of Northwest California's Mendocino County. Uh, during an 1892 storm, a lumber schooner sank and five of the sailors aboard were drowned, including three Chinese. As the bodies of the drowned men washed ashore, the local white ranch family buried them in their tiny family plot cemetery. And the big arrow on the left shot indicates where this little tiny family plot cemetery is. Anyway, it took me about four days of machete work to clear out the cemetery and find the graves. Okay, coming to the end of our show, um, can't talk about California and Chinese history without mentioning neighboring areas. I already mentioned that some Chinese tried to sneak into California from Mexico, but plenty of Chinese just got out of Dodge. They left California 
tried to get away from the nastiness, the racism, the institutional hatred, and they went to Mexico. And as anti-Chinese sentiment in California grew, many Chinese immigrants uh, then went to Baja California. Eventually, Mexicali, which is number one on the satellite shot at the left, had more Chinese residents than Mexican ones. And even today, it's still the most Chinese city in all of Mexico. And on the right is kind of a humorous Mexican uh, cartoon showing just how Chinese the entire Baja California Peninsula is. But things were not all rosy. Um, anyway, uh, many, many hundreds of Chinese ended up in northern Mexico. Most of them became truck farmers, grocers, or small shop owners. And it all came to an end during the very bloody Mexican Revolution when Pancho Villa, who had a pathological hatred of the Chinese, embarked on a campaign of mass murder. And one of his nicknames, one he was particularly proud of, was Matachino, which means Chinese killer. Hundreds of Chinese were murdered, and most of the survivors fled north to Mexicali, the only town in Mexico where they were safe. And then on the opposite end of, of things, there's British Columbia, of course. As early as the Fraser River Gold Rush of 1857, Chinese miners were working and living in British Columbia. And for more than 150 years, California-bound Chinese left British Hong Kong for British Columbia, and then they headed south. Today, Vancouver, British Columbia, has the largest Asian population, about 30% of any major city in North America, and also the largest percentage of Chinese, 23% of any city in North America, including some of my own relatives. Okay, final slide. Anyway, uh, last week I, I gave this quote, but it's good enough to give again. Uh, after I told one of my elderly Hawaiian Chinese relatives about how bad things were in California, uh, he said, and I quote, thank God my ancestors stepped off the boat in Hawaii instead of California. So why were the Chinese treated so badly in California? Well, the answer applies just as much today, where we're seeing a deplorable upsurge in anti-Asian racism and violence across America. It applies just as much as it did in California 150 years ago. And I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist, so this is crystal clear to me, man. Anyway, anti-Chinese violence uh, is the result of racial hatred, what we call racism today. And hatred is almost always the result of fear. And fear is almost always the result of ignorance or stupidity. And as an old university professor, I can tell you, stupidity cannot be cured, but ignorance can, not through legislation, but through education. And so that's what schools, what books, and what organizations like those three hosting my two lectures are for. And it's also a large part of why I've been teaching this subject on the university level for more than 40 years. So thanks so very much for listening. And now I'll take questions if Gary wants to shoot some to me. Thank you very, very much. That was an excellent, excellent presentation. Before we go to the Q&A, though, I'd like to take a few minutes to share some important resources with all of you that I mentioned last week. I'm sure that most of you are going to find this helpful as a, as a reminder, and because many of you were not able to attend last week. As I said earlier, Brian and I are both members of the Sunshin Association of Honolulu, Hawaii, which is part of the Worldwide Hakka Association. TTA Hawaii has been there since the early 1900s. And our membership book actually has listings as far back as 1913 and covers 144 Hakka surnames with a number of members listed under each surname. Many people have used this as a valuable starting point in discovering their roots. The Tsunshin Association also sponsors a number of social and educational programs during the year and awards scholarships to diver, uh, deserving individuals. So this scholarship program is open to anyone. 
And you can get more information about that and everything else by going to our website. You know, one of our community partners is the Bay Area Chinese Genealogy Group and has been instrumental in helping us with this first webinar series that you're participating in today. They offer a multitude of ways to help you learn about embracing your culture while offering guidance in researching your roots. While, they're, while they've done um, programs like um, what you did, what, what you didn't know about that your parents didn't tell you about Chinese New Year, and one about explaining family and district associations. They've also done one on how to use census and the vital records data to find out about your past. Our other community partner is the Chinese Family History Group of Southern California. Their mission is dedicated to preserving, documenting, and sharing the stories of our Chinese and Chinese ancestors, Chinese American ancestors. Their website helps beginners to get started, has an ancestral village guide. It also has a list of government resources to help you research along with other valuable tools. Lastly, I wanna mention two others that I talked about last week. The Hawaii Chinese History Center here in Honolulu, Hawaii, an extremely valuable resource if you have relatives in or originally from Hawaii. Doug Chong runs the History Center, which is in its 44th year and probably knows so much more, so much about the Chinese Hakka and, and Cantonese experience, having spent almost his entire life to help preserve Chinese history here in Hawaii. The History Center houses some of the most amazing resources for Hawaiian Chinese history. And I can't say enough about helping to support this really tiny gem of a place. Finally, the Root Friends of Roots organization who opened an entirely new window to my life. For the past 31 years, their Roots and Roots Plus programs have made it possible for Chinese American students and adults to locate their ancestral villages in China. The program includes many hours of fascinating educational workshops to help you learn what it actually means to be Chinese. It was a commitment that I made that went way beyond just discovering what villages that my ancestors originated from. You know, in a majority of these villages, there, there's a huge tree that usually stands as the main gathering place for the town. And after making the trek back there and standing in the shade of that big tree in my grandfather's village where he was born, I could just imagine its roots stretching for thousands of miles deep under the Pacific Ocean that connected with one in the yard where my grandfather started his family in Hawaii and where my father was born. This is highly unlikely, of course, in reality. But what it ended up happening was that I finally felt a real sense of connection to my past by taking this journey, a past that I, I knew absolutely nothing about before making it. Realizing that there, there are so many old people in these villages that are dying off, leaving a void for someone to accurately point out where and which house our grandfathers or our grandmothers were born in. The search for your roots is hardly easy, but it's important to begin now. That means not leaving it to your kids to do so, because by that time, all of those actual eyewitnesses to history that I mentioned will be long gone. So take advantage of today after this program is over. If you haven't begun, begin. If you're continuing your search, use these resources I just mentioned to you to discover something new. I guarantee you're gonna discover something you never known before. Become a member or a supporter of any or all of these organizations. And at the end of this program, I'll tell you how to get a hold of them. All right, so let's bring back Dr. Dylan Brian for our Q and A. So Brian, let me see. I'll, we have a quite a bit of questions here. So 
And we don't have that much time, but let's see. So Carol Young asked, last week you spoke a lot about the Hakka in Hawaii, but I'm curious about being Cantonese as to the impact the Punti immigrants contributed to the Hawaiian society and economy. Well, again, uh, only had 45 minutes last week and only have 45 minutes this week. So I tried to do mostly Hakka stuff last week and mostly Cantonese stuff this week. But of course, um, there were always both, both groups in both areas. I know considerably less about the Punti in Hawaii uh, than I do about the Hakka, mainly because most of the elderly relatives I interviewed were all Hakka. And the Punti element in, in my family, uh, the thread was more or less cut, okay? But there are plenty of, of authorities on Punti culture history running around Hawaii and they just love to talk to anybody. And so the, the, the basic thing to do, whether you're in California or in Hawaii, is try to figure out what kind of ethnic Chinese you are before you start looking. Uh, if you talk to the average white guy, you know, with in, in some archive, he won't know that there are more than one kind of Chinese. But obviously, if if somebody starts telling you all about the other kind, you know, say, well, thanks, but that's not my people, you know. So uh, again, I don't have really specific information beyond what I how I answered one of the questions last week. Go to the UH. Go to the University of Hawaii East West Center. Go to the Honolulu Public Library. Go to the Hawaii Start State Archives, go to the Bishop Museum. All of them have specialists that know a lot more about Punti history than I do, okay? But that's where you start. And like I say, start in the library, but don't stay in the library. I mean, hunt down the oldest member of your family you can find. Gary's right on the money. And last week, go, go play last week's lecture, and I give very specific instructions on how to do oral history interviewing. And it's a gold mine. And like you say, these folks are leaving us every day. Don't put it off. Do it, do it as soon as you can. So there you go. Right, right. Okay, this one is from Valerie Johnson. And she says, if people who spoke different Chinese languages are able to read the same newspaper because traditional characters were the same, did simplified Chinese have an impact? Again, uh, I talked about this last week. I kind of belabored this issue last week. So the answer is embedded in the video for last week. We're gonna move on to something different. Uh, yes, all language changes over time and all writing systems change over time. And so for example, the kind of Chinese characters you find on a Chinese typewriter <laughs> are gonna be different from those that the poets learned a thousand years ago. I mean, it's a much more simplified thing. But again, it doesn't change the fact that different speakers of different languages cannot understand the other guy's language, but they can understand the writing system because it's not phonetic, it's ideographic. The characters represent ideas, not sounds. So there's a short answer there. I, I would imagine when you're doing research that there's a lot of written material that has both the old stuff, if you go way back, yeah. and then the simplified version. So you're gonna have to understand both how to de interpret both then, yeah. yeah. All right, well, Cal Lee says, once a woman is married, it's as if she disappeared. <laughs> my grandmother is known only as wife of my grandfather. Yeah. I can only find her family surname, mm -hmm. but not her full maiden name. So how do you research the maternal side of a Chinese family? Wow, good question. Um, Again, I know much more about the Hakka element here than I do about the Cantonese, but she's right. Uh, amongst many, many Cantonese people, uh, you know, women are just ciphers, they're shadows. And especially in, in families where you have plural wives. I mean, if you're, if you're the third wife, man, you, you got to do everything you can to try to improve your status. And unless you do, and usually by producing a lot of sons, you're just forgotten. And, and after three or four generations, you're, you're edited out of the script, man. So I don't have an easy answer for this uh, other than 
You're going to have to talk to those evil exploitative men and read what the evil exploitative men wrote down because quite frequently the women were not literate. Okay, They didn't necessarily write their own stories. They left it up to their husbands or the scribes that were hired by their husbands. Uh, totally different story amongst the Hakka. The Hakka women were much more equal to the men. Uh, many, many more of them came with their husbands to Hawaii. And um, basically, uh, you know, the old joke, and I don't want to offend anyone here, but a lot of my elderly female Hakka relatives said, yeah, I mean, any Hakka woman with her big feet could whip any three punti men. We never bound their feet and we could whoop them. And of course, the punti referred to the Hakka women as the Bigfoot women, you know, but they didn't okay. guff off of anybody. And so as a consequence, if you're dealing with Hakka history, there's typically a lot more information about the female side than you find in Cantonese history. Okay. Uh, let's see. Joseph Yoshino asks, I've spoken to a couple of people whose Chinese ancestors married Native American women. Mm -hmm. Did that happen a lot? It did. It did. In, in California, I, I actually just published a paper last year on Hawaiians in California, because uh, what happened was, and I'm not, I'm not trying to dodge the, the question, but uh, the whole, if you think the Chinese were ignored by California historians, just try the Hawaiians. <laughs> there were Hawaiians in California before the gold rush, and then lots of Hawaiians came during the gold rush. And then by the 1870s, they're, they're almost gone. They disappeared. What happened to them? They all intermarried with California Indians. They became, for all intents and purposes, California Indians. And so I ran into, I, I'm an archaeologist, so I'm always hanging out with Indians. And so I found lots and lots of California Indians that had a Hawaiian grandfather. Now, I haven't started asking about a Chinese grandfather, but I'm sure this was a very common situation. It wasn't that the Chinese guy took the Indian wife with him to the ghetto in the big city. Uh -uh. He just moved in with her folks and uh, basically became Indian. And this was very, very common. It happened all over Mexico. It happened all over Central America. Uh, one guy sent me an email after last week's talk, and I, I jokingly said, well, I, I spent 40 years working in Guatemala. There's only 800 Chinese in Guatemala, but I know half of them, you know, and then his next question was, okay, do they marry Chinese women or do they marry local Maya girls? And it's about half and half. And of course, if you, if you send back to the marriage broker and go through the whole multi-year thing, and you get a Chinese wife from Taiwan, then you stay fully Chinese. But once you marry into the local Indian community, hey, you know, I've got a lot of friends named Francisco Wong or Eddie Berto Chang, you know, or things like this. And, and their kids stop speaking Chinese and start speaking the local Indian language. So oh. it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastically interesting deal. But yes, absolutely happened all over California. If you had to have a wife, man, and you weren't going to go back to China, you many, many more Chinese men actually married Mexican women than they married American Indian women. Because, you know, if, if you think it was bad for the Chinese in California, it was worse for the Indians. But uh, there were an awful lot of mixed marriages, so much so that the nastiest white guys on the planet passed laws against Chinese marrying anybody other than Chinese, and then they prohibited the importation of Chinese women too. So, I mean, what are you going to do? You know. But anyway, kind of a long answer to a really, really good question. Okay. Uh, let's see, Jim Hewen, why were there few immigrants from Shanghai and northern China? Why the majority of Canton see up regions and few from Shanghai? Uh, real good question. There were even fewer <laughs> from North China. Shanghai, of course, today the biggest city in China and almost anybody that visits China, you got to go to Shanghai. You know, it's the powerhouse. Uh, but they just weren't that interested uh, in the 1840s, 1850s. A few came, but very, I mean, very few compared to the people in Kwangtung. You know, I mean, Kwangtung, 
uh, as I said last week, you know, was the most troublesome of all Chinese provinces, you know, and always was. Um, the South Chinese had a wanderlust that most other Chinese did not. And so it's not just an interest in coming to California, but who colonized the Philippines a thousand years ago? Well, it was people from South China, not necessarily Kwangtung, but from neighboring provinces. And then once the tidal wave of immigration heads out to the California gold fields, it's about 90, 98% all from Kwangtung. Same thing with the Hawaii. So um, don't know, don't know. It's just that the, the, the Northern Chinese and the Central Chinese were much more insular and they really didn't care much about the outside world. Whereas the Punti and the Hakka way down South said, you know, maybe it's better somewhere else. And even if it isn't, let's give it a try, you know? So yeah. again, kind of a long answer to a short question. Okay. Uh, let's see, Jeffrey Carnett. I heard that the earliest illegal immigration from Mexico were actually Chinese who were forced out of the US, went to Mexico and then came back. Wonder if this is true. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I spent my, my entire adult life in Latin America. Uh, a lot of that sitting around in Mexican bus stations at two in the morning, you know, waiting for the bus and all that kind of stuff. So I talked to endless numbers of people either coming back from the states or trying to sneak into the states or whatever. Um, the big influx of, quote, illegal aliens, unquote, the biggest influx was generated by the Mexican Revolution. I mean, that was such a bloodbath throughout Mexico. That really triggered the big, big mass migration into the American Southwest and Southern California from Mexico. Once again, these are refugees running for their lives. And if you were in Mexico and you were Chinese at that time, like I said in today's lecture, your, your, your life wasn't worth a plug nickel. Uh, Pancho Villa was out to get you. He saw the Chinese as the, you know, the insects uh, sucking the lifeblood out of us Mexicans and all this kind of stuff. And he went out of his way to murder Chinese every chance he got. So yes, a lot of Chinese people came into the southwestern U.S. and Southern California that had already put down roots in northern Mexico and were perfectly happy in northern Mexico until the Mexican Revolution. The Mexican Revolution gets started about 1911. Pancho Villa comes into his own around 1913, and he just goes hog wild around 1916. And again, we sent our own troops into Mexico uh, in 1914 to Veracruz. My grandfather didn't go there, but then we sent him into central Mexico in 1916. And my grandfather was a translator on the borders, uh, translating between the Mexican forces and the Americans. And he was actually decorated by the Viistas. He, I can show you a Mexican Viista medal they gave my grandfather because he was trying to calm things down on the California border. So anyway, again, kind of a long uh, answer to a, a very good question. <coughs> let's, let's see what, how much time. Okay, let me go ahead. I have two more questions. Uh, this one is from P. Chow. Do you know who were the Chinese that went to work in the Oregon fisheries? Um, no, not really. This is I, I'm. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a patriotic fifth generation California boy, and I got deep roots in Hawaii, deep roots in Central America. I even have roots in British Columbia and Washington State, but I don't know Oregon very well. Okay, Oregon is kind of like we, we refer to Oregon as Baja, Washington, you know. But anyway, um, I would assume they were the same folks that got established up and down the California coast. Uh, again, I apologize. I really don't know that much about the, the Chinese in Oregon, but I'm sure if you hit some of the local historical societies, uh, they would be able to help you. And also, believe it or not, in California, the state parks outfit has some really good historians and archaeologists on staff that have made it their, their mission in life to, to learn about the California Chinese. And so, even if you go to Oregon and they can't help you, some of the Chinese state 
I'm sorry, some of the California state parks folks that know about those California state parks like China Camp in Marin County might be able to tell you a little bit about the same stuff going on in Oregon at the same time. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see, Robert Ina, are there historical records of the Chinese in the Hilo area? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, uh, last week I, I showed a slide of a sort of a small circulation publication on the Big Island Chinese. So yeah, Hilo was a big center for Chinese, of course. And, and it was the other big town that a lot of Chinese gravitated to after their five-year hitch cutting cane was up. Um, the, there, are, there is a Hilo Historical Society. There's the Big Island Historical Society. Also, I seem to remember uh, one of the questions that was asked was about the Tong Wo slide I showed last week. How can I find out more information about Tong Wo? <coughs> Again, it's no longer active full-time as a Hakka sort of hangout, but it is administered by the state parks of Hawaii. So once again, if you go to the Hawaiian state parks, they will direct you to who knows uh, what about uh, Chinese in, say, Hilo and also over at Tong Wo. So again, it's just a matter of picking up the phone and starting to call bureaucrats until the, the, you get the right bureaucrat and then he passes you on to somebody who knows something. Um, the organization is still active. They just don't have any way to contact them directly through Tong Wo. But if you get a hold of the Tong Wo folks, I'm sure they could tell you all about Hilo as well. Okay. Okay. Well, listen, I think we are, uh, our time is up today. <laughs> um, there's still a lot of questions for any of those that didn't get their questions answered. Please go ahead and email uh, us at sungshinhawaii at gmail.com and I'll give you that address and all the rest of the information after this. But uh, we won't be able to answer all of your questions that you write in. <laughs> Obviously, we don't want to work, have Brian work for the next so many weeks on just answering all these questions, but we'll try and get, get and help you that. On the, on the Tong Wo, actually, I, I visited that place, you know, Brian, um, the other year, just before the pandemic. And they only open once a year, just, just to have some ceremonies. And so uh, the, uh, anybody wants to know about that question, I can also answer that uh, with giving you a little uh, guidance as to where you might be able to find that information. Anyway, uh, our time has actually come to an end. And so, like I said, if you have any specific questions for Dr. Dillon, just send it over to us at sungshinhawaii at gmail.com. And this address and the links to all of the resources that I had mentioned earlier will be shown at the end of this presentation. And they're also gonna be included in the email that you're gonna be receiving with links to both of the recorded webinars. So let me just personally thank our two community partners, the Bay Area Chinese Genealogy Group and the Chinese Family History Group of Southern California, Edwina Lee and Luther Chong of Sung Shin, Doug Joe of BACGG for him jumping in at the last minute to help us out. Of course, John Dillon, Dr. Dillon's son, who took over many of the things that I would have had to do that I, that I didn't know even know how to do. Jeannie Young, our taskmaster, and I call her our Luna, <laughs> to keep things on track. And of course, a big shout out to Gail Chong, whose devotion to this project from the very beginning has been outright out inspiring, and who spent so many hours with me trying to explain things. <laughs> I've been told by her doctor that I gave her orders, strict orders not to talk for a few weeks. So. <laughs> Sorry, Gail. <laughs> and of course, our guest speaker, Dr. Brian Dillon. Brian, incredible job. Just, just incredible. Thank you so much for helping us out. My pleasure. Anytime. Anytime. Lastly, the most important person that made all of this possible, and that is you. Thank you for your, spending your time with us on Saturday. 
for giving you your support and thank you for your kind words. Finally, my last thoughts. You know, in this world we live in right now, there's so much racial disharmony. It, it's almost like it's become fashionable to hate each other. But why? How we treat our fellow human being is based a lot on what it, they look like and whether they speak the same language as us. That's why it's so important to tell your own story. It's so someone on the other side of the world or even that lives on the other side of your town will realize that we share so many things in common and yet unique in so many different ways. And I have a feeling that there are so many racists out there in the world that just love eating Chinese food. <laughs> they probably order takeout. But seriously, don't leave it to others to tell your story because your story is our story. Until we meet again, mahalo and aloha. <laughs>